I'm glad to be here and I'd like to welcome. Okay. I, I'm not on the screen. Okay, that's great. <laughs> nice planning. Okay. I thought you were telling me to get out of here. <laughs> that Maybe that's laughter the speech. Okay, well, uh, welcome to Georgia uh, University uh, members that were here today and talked about our, our scholarship thing. I, I'm glad to see you here. And uh, welcome to all my fellow uh, AVVBA members, and if there are any wives here, the wives also. Uh, I'm going to try to run through this uh, fairly fast. I originally had planned on, I have a video. Uh, you pr many of you have probably seen it. It's on the dogfight series, episode 13, Gun Kills of Vietnam. Uh, I was the first gun kill of Vietnam, by the way. That's because I didn't have sidewinders and sparrows like all the big boys in the jets. So anyhow, uh, Skip gave a very nice introduction. I should have written less for that because, uh, it, oh, geez, it, it went on forever, right? Eh? <laughs> okay. I originally, uh, when I got out of flight training, I was in a squadron called Utility Squadron 1. One of my jobs was to tow targets. And when I got in VA-25, uh, three years later, uh, I told all my pilot members, I was a squadron safety officer. I said, don't worry about getting shot down. I said, I towed targets for two years, and uh, if the U.S. Navy can't hit the target that I was towing, I'm sure these guys can't hit the target that's moving faster. Uh, unfortunately, I was slightly in error on that. I found out to my uh, dismay later on. I didn't get shot down, but I did get a big chunk out of one wing. Well, anyhow, let's uh, fast forward to uh, the story about the MiG. Uh, we had had uh, several MiG encounters up to the time that I encountered one. Three days before us, members of VF-21 shot down two MiGs. Uh, that was on June 17th, 1965. Three days later, we were on standby to do a rescue for an Air Force pilot uh, you know, the Navy's always there to help out the Air Force when they get in trouble. Who is uh, actually standing with one foot in China and one foot in North Vietnam on the ground. We were going to go up and uh, do cover while they tried to sneak some he he helos up through Laos and uh, Cambodia to pick them up. Well, we, uh, we manned up the airplane and uh, 120 degree deck temperature, no air conditioning, uh, except for our air conditioner in front. You know, the, the Sky Raider did have an air conditioner. It was the propeller. When it stopped, the pilot really sweated. So that was our air conditioner. Anyhow, uh, it, was, it was terrible. It was really hot on the deck. And we manned up, and they said, forget it. Go back down. So we went back down to the ready room uh, where we had air conditioning and sat around for a while. And... Uh, had a cheeseburger, and then we decided to watch the movie that night since we were only on standby. Just as the movie cranked up, they said, man up your airplanes, and off you go. So we went out and manned up, and uh, they canceled us again. So we went back down. We are back down for about five minutes, said we changed our mind. Let's go, guys. Okay, this has got to be real sooner or later. So four of us took off, and... Uh, I don't know how well you can see this picture. I'll move it a little bit forward here. Uh, if you look at, yeah, this picture right here. There's four pilots there. Jim Lynn, Ed Greathouse, who just passed away a couple weeks ago. Me, Charlie Hartman. Jim Lynn and Charlie Hartman died young. And Ed is gone, so I'm the last surviving member right now. And uh, you can just set it down that way. Oh, yeah, that's good. So the four of us, and if, if you could look at that picture and see it pretty well, uh, you'll notice that nobody's in the same flight uniform. Uh, we look pretty ragtag, right? You know, we're no ascots, blue angels, golden wings, that kind of stuff. The reason for that is 
that the laundry and morale officer on the USS Midway decided that he would only wash one flight suit a week for pilots. Well, let me tell you, we had a little contest in my squadron. It's called a sweat stain contest. The first guy to merge his armpit sweat stains at the zipper drank free on the next Liberty. I, I got to tell you, there's always cheaters in the bunch. There were guys doing push-ups in their flight suits all the time. So to get around this, the first time in port, I went to Marine small stores and got a couple sets of Marine fatigues. And that's me in Marine fatigues. Charlie's in the jungle suit. This is a World War II brown one, which they didn't recognize the flight suit, so they'd wash it extra for him. Uh, he was a leader. He was a lieutenant commander, so he went with regulations. Uh, it did. Okay, anyhow, that brings us up to the launch. We launch. The sun is starting to set. I had an airplane called a middleman. It had two radios in it connected by a relay. My job on a rescue was to stay at altitude over the down pilot while the other two guys covered him with my wingman and take their transmissions through my airplane back to the ship. In other words, I was a flying antenna. Well, we had a lot of trouble with that system. On my cat shot, I lost my radios. I fiddled around, got one working. Uh, we went feet dry, and we were a no-talk squadron. Uh, we did one, two, three, four, and I was three, and I came up, and the radio worked, and then I lost it again. No radio, no radio at all. So we're flying in northwest past Than Hoa. Pretty much everybody that worked over North Vietnam knows where Than Hoa, that's where the famous Than Hoa Bridge was, which was determined to be the catch that held the two halves of the earth together. And if we ever cut that bridge, it would blow up the earth. Well, we never cut that bridge till the very end of the war, the last year. Anyhow, we're going by the bridge. That was also uh, known as North Vietnam Aluminum Factory for all our airplanes that were shot down around the bridge. Uh, so we're passing Than Hoa, heading up towards the uh, northwest, towards the Chinese border. Uh, no radio. Suddenly, my flight leader rolls inverted, heads for the ground. Well, that's my job to be with my flight leader. I also had a, uh, a rule that if I pointed the nose at the ground, the gun switches came on immediately. So I flipped my gun switches on, and we're in a dive. And we go all the way to the deck and pull out, and I can see in my mirror a Philippine F-86 shooting at me. I thought, that's sort of strange. Now, wait a minute, we're over North Vietnam. That must be, oh, it is, it is. And we're, I'm watching the tracers go by. They had two sizes of tracers, golf balls, tennis balls, only they were on fire. And uh, they, he was firing everything. I found out later on that he made seven unsuccessful passes on my wingman, Charlie Hartman, and I did not hit us. Charlie got a snapshot at him but missed him. He went up when he ran out of ammo and sat at 10,000 feet. We were on the deck, and uh, if you can see this in zoom, right there, that shows us what happened. We came around that mountain there in the trees, and my flight leader and his wingman, this guy, this MiG, was coming down on their tail to shoot him down. He had him. He had been working on them, and he had them. I fired, oops, I fired a snapshot, and he saw the tracers, and he panicked and turned into us. Bad mistake. We could never catch a jet, but when you turn into us, you make it easy. So he had eight 20 millimeters firing at him at the same time. Several hits, aluminum coming off the airplane, a couple down the engines, through the cockpit, through us, and you saw how close that was in the picture, if you could see it. Uh, I played chicken with him. Uh, I did that a little as a teenager in Detroit, too, but uh, th this was a little more serious. And uh, 
I held the nose down until I was pretty sure I was going to run into him, and I snapped the stick back, and my wingman said I couldn't have missed him by more than an inch. But anyhow, he went between us, he rolled inverted, and he crashed into a hill. More on that later. Uh, we then joined up. Our flight leader and his wingman headed for the beach. They, were, they, were, we had, they had dropped their drop tanks, so they didn't have extra fuel. Charlie had dropped his. I had not dropped his because I hadn't heard what was going on on the radio. Suddenly, I get my radio back for some reason, and I'm talking to Charlie, and uh, I'm giving him hand signals, and we made uh, we did some pretty sophisticated hand signals, and I'm going, which means you go up and chase that guy that just climbed to altitude. I'm going to go down and intercept him on the way to Fukien. Dumb idea. So we get a call from our flight leader. He said, are you two idiots still in there? He was a former enlisted man. That's why he called junior pilots idiots. Anyhow, uh, we said, yeah. He said, well, you better get out of there. He says, you got 10 bogeys coming your way. And so I did a quick math on that, two against 10. Uh, it was really unfair to the North Vietnamese Air Force if we stayed around. I didn't want to be unfair to them, so we went. We followed our leader back to the ship. Made a night landing, which Skip referred to, night landing, nothing to it, right? <laughs> and uh, that was the end of the MiG shoot down. Well, they couldn't decide to give us medals or not, so... We got a message from General Key. He had just taken over as Premier of South Vietnam. And his first thing he did was hang a profiteer in the town square in Saigon. And we were his second official duty. He called us in, and the four of us went into the palace, and we were given uh, uh, the Air Gallantry Medal with Golden Wing and uh, commissions in the South Vietnamese Air Force, which I still hold, I guess, if they existed. I always looked at it as a fallback job, and then, you know, you know what happened, right? So, we're back on the ship, and the skippers tell us, you're not going to get any medals. I mean, okay, right, that's fine. Uh, we've been through this route before. We're Sky Raider pilots. We don't deserve medals. We don't wear, we don't wear ascots with our flight suit. Okay, so uh, we went in to see General Key. I had a little tea with Key in the palace, and we flew back, and they said, everything's changed. We're given uh, two F-4 pilots silver stars. We're given Clint, Charlie, silver stars, and the other two guys, uh, Ed and uh, Jim, are going to get DFCs. Oh, that's nice. Okay, now I can wear my foreign decoration because I had no medals. Believe it or not, all the time that I'd been in the service, I had never gotten any kind of medal, including, of course, a good conduct medal. Of course, everybody knows why that. But anyhow, the, uh, they gave us silver, silver stars uh, to Charlie and me, and then we became sort of heroes. We went into port in Japan. They made us the subject of a Japanese comic book. Uh, we got a lot of news coverage at home, uh, which really busted me because I had told my mother I was still in Lamore, California, so she wouldn't worry. And they went to where she worked and said, hey, your son shot down a MiG. She said, no, 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 not my son. He's in Lamore, California. And I said, well, is this him? Oh, that's my son. So I caught, I caught a little real flack when I got home from the cruise. Okay, that takes care of the MIG, MIG kill. Uh, how are we doing? Okay. Then, time went by. I gave a lot of speeches, et cetera, and uh, interviews. And then Charlie Tut, our former, who is a member of AVVBA. Charlie, you here today? I didn't see you coming in. Okay. And Jim Hugoworth and uh, Dave Schilling. And, uh, and I, four of us from Atlanta, plus seven guys from California, we got a group together and we went to Hanoi at the invitation of General Swat, who was the 
uh, Air Force Chief of Operations. And uh, they entertained us, took us to their Vietnam Wall, which uh, I saw the pilot's name that I shot down for the first time. And uh, we also went to the Hanoi Hilton, which, by the way, you might not know this unless you've been there recently. It's pretty much a facade now. It has two cells and the front doors and that. They built a, an office building where it used to stand behind it. And uh, we went out to Phu Can Field with General Swat, big group of us, a big group of Vietnamese pilots, and he said, now, no pictures in that direction. You take pictures that way. So we all turned our <laughs> Must be a good reason to not take them in that. So then we had a big dinner. We're at tables like this, about eight people at the tables. And my wife is with me. She went along as adult supervisor of this group, uh, and we needed it. She's looking at the name tags. She says, oh, here's me. Here's you. Who is this senior colonel Mui Duc Thua? I said, who knows? So we sat down at dinner, and this older gentleman comes over, and uh, I have a picture of him here. That's Louis Dactois and me at dinner. The interpreter, come, the interpreter comes up to me and says, uh, Captain Johnson, this is Senior Colonel Mui Dactois. I believe you have met before. Uh-oh. <laughs> he was the flight leader of the guy I shot down. We had been warned that they would try to get us to apologize for our actions in, in Vietnam. And of course, he did. He made, he made a college try, you know, but uh, not serious. He said to me during dinner, through an interpreter, he said, Captain Johnson, he said, do you know that the man you shot down was only 28 years old and he had a daughter? I said, no, I didn't know that. But you know, when I shot him down, I was 28 years old and I had a son and a daughter. That was it. No more tries at apologies from then on. That, that was, he, he knew he wasn't going to get anywhere. Well, uh, I have to tell you how I got there. I'm a tax preparer, and this happened on April 13th to go to Hanoi. Oh, wrong time, but I wanted to go. So my wife and I got on Korean Air. Flew, uh, we flew Delta to LA, Korean Air to uh, uh, Incheon, and uh, Korean Air down to Hanoi. And had a couple dinners and flew Korean Air back. That's a long time to go for dinner. It's a long drive. But we did it successfully. Now, they gave us some things, and I will hold them up. They gave us all this very nice model. This is a Sukhoi fighter. This is their new. God, my world is crumbling. <laughs> Anyhow, that's their new fighter they have. Uh, and I'll show you another picture. This is the group of the Vietnamese and Americans right here. There we go. I got it. Okay. That's all of us standing there. And that was it for that. But a year and a half later, they wanted to come over here. So we invited them over here and they came 32 strong we took them to the air museum in San Diego uh, we took them to USS Midway where one of those pilots and I co-chaired a uh, discussion on what it was like to fly in our various services and uh, had some protesters there because it was open to the public and you know they we got the uh, thing about he shouldn't have been there and all that. And he, he jumped on a guy, I jumped on a guy, and a guy left. Okay, that sort, of worked, that sort of worked out well. Okay, now, the Vietnamese, they published a book, which we called the Red Book. And that's the entire MIG action of 
Vietnam War. But we said, thank you for the nice red book, but we don't read Vietnamese. So a few years later, we got in the mail their translated copy, which we now call the Blue Book. Okay. Speak, speaking to the Vietnamese pilots was very interesting. I'll give you a couple of anecdotes uh, that happened. One pilot I was talking with and I said, uh, how did you, uh, did you get a, a U.S. air kill? And he said, uh, no, no. I, I said, well, how'd you get shot down? He said, I don't like to talk about it. I said, well, come on. He said, well, there I was flying along in flight. And he said, all of a sudden I was in my chute coming down. And he said, I landed. I got a ride. He said, first of all, all the natives beat me up. They hit me with pitchforks and stuff because they thought I was an, only an American pilot get shot down, right? He said, but an army guy rescued me and they drove me back to the base. And he said, I walked into the club and everybody's laughing and pointing at me. So how did you get shot down? He got shot down by a ship whose code name was Red Crown. It was a destroyer that sat off Haiphong Harbor. They bagged him. By the way, Red Crown was the leading ace of the war for the United States, seven kills. That they got guys that got a little too close to the coastline or they were heading out towards the carriers and they just bagged them. They didn't ask questions. Yeah, surface Navy, that, that must be Mark Walker. <laughs> Okay, uh, another thing that happened, and they verified this, I knew about this, I had heard about it through intelligence sources, but I had never had it verified, but they verified that after we shot down that MiG, they pulled all the MiGs out of action, sent all the pilots back to Russia, because the Russians had taught them to fly the MiGs, but they hadn't taught them tactics. They operated in two dimensions. That is three dimensions. And they were losing MiGs like crazy. So they all went back to school for almost a year, and there was only one MiG encounter during that year. Uh, a former Blue Angel uh, bagged one in October. Um, and uh, other than that, nothing happened. So that, that was sort of it. That's the, uh, uh, the whole deal there. Uh, you can, the people who are here can look at this, but uh, here's a nice picture of the Midway on here, if I can get this up in front of me. There we go. Yeah, up in the, uh, your upper right corner, that's the USS Midway. That no longer exists uh, as an operational ship, it's a museum ship in um, San Diego now. So, uh, if you get out there, go aboard the USS Midway. I went to the decommissioning ceremony in 1993. They had planned in the ceremony on 1,500 vis visitors. They had more like 15,000. They had almost every former CO and squadron commander and air group commander, and they had pilots and enlisted guys, and just people all the way back to 1945 that had been on the ship. It was a great ceremony. They had two lines, one for ball caps, one for t-shirts. Well, I got in the ball cap line, I got my ball cap, and the t-shirt line I got in, they were, they were all gone. They never ordered enough, so I only got a ball cap. But anyhow, that's the Midway story. Uh, my, most of my naval aviation career, my carrier landings were either on the Midway, the Coral Sea, or the FDR. That's the first carrier name for a Roosevelt. And, uh, those are the three ships of the class. That's the Midway class ships. The FDR went down early. I don't know what they did with it, but it disappeared. The Coral Sea, is anybody a member of, a and, uh, of uh, Navy League here? Oh, I see a hand in the back. Well, in the Navy League magazine, over a two year period, they showed the Coral Sea slowly disappearing until it was down to just the keel and it was gone. So when you go out to hop in your SUV, you're probably driving around in part of the Coral Sea right now. Okay. Uh, 
that's essentially all I got. Uh, Skip, thank you for inviting me. And uh, uh, so, anybody got any questions? Everybody was asking me questions walking around. Oh, I see one. There's a hand up there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a very famous picture. It's the single most famous Navy picture, naval aviation picture from the Vietnam War. It shows a Sky Raider on a catapult with a toilet bowl under the right wing. Uh, I, I, for years I tried to dodge the issue because I was the guy, it was my men in the line division that found the toilet bowl. They were going to throw it overboard. It had a little crack in it. They said, oh, we, gotta, we can use that toilet bowl. They didn't tell them what for. Well, what they did is they built it a bomb rack and a nose fuse and tail fins, and we hung it on the airplane. And our checkers that watched the airplane all the way up to the, the catapult, they did the sidestep. Like this, as the airplane taxied forward so that the bridge could not see this. Well, then they got on the cat, and the captain of the ship could see it, and he's on the 1MC, and what the hell is on Canasta's wing? Well, boom, we were gone. That got dropped on a, uh, a recce mission with a uh, Army forward air controller with a Vietnamese observer with him. And uh, we had, I, I don't know if you remember, but uh, every ordinate, piece of ordinance had a name. Like 2,000 pound bomb was a Cadillac, and a 500 pound, pound bomb was an Oldsmobile, and a Chevy was a 250. And uh, the Ford air controllers, we'd check in with them, we'd say, hey, we got a couple of Cadillacs and a couple of Oldsmobiles, and hey, okay, okay, you know. And uh, and then our leader of the flight said, and one code name, Sandy Flush. And the guy says, I haven't heard that before. Well, join up on it. So he sees it and he starts laughing. Well, we dropped that. We found out later on, we took a movie of it. We had an airplane flying behind him with a camera. Well, it comes off and of course it turns hold of the wind and stops dead in midair. And the wing of the camera airplane goes up like that. Just missed him. And the Ford air controller said it whistled all the way down. <laughs> and then, of course, the North Vietnamese tried to accuse us of germ warfare. <laughs> but that was a very, very famous toilet bowl incident. Any other questions? Way back there. Oh, okay. Uh, I went back there in uh, 18, April 18. And the make shoot down you asked me for was uh, June of 65. And, and the Vietnamese came over in October of 19 to visit with us. Uh, any other questions? Hmm. Yeah. Did you read a little bit out of the book? I wouldn't expect Did I what? Yeah. I still can't hear you. I got you Ralph. You need to sound off. Read out of the blue book and sentence or two. Read out of the blue book and sentence or two. He wants you to read the blue book to us and tell me you go to sleep. <laughs> okay. Well, it's in English, uh, and they and they cover all of the uh, MIG encounters in there, both. Pro and con, you know, the guys that got shot down or the guys that shot down one. And it's dedicated to Clint Johnson with kind regards, all the best. Uh, Nguyen C. Hung. Uh, he was the guy that translated the Red Book. And I got that in April of 2021. It's, uh, oh, I don't know. They. Does it have your uh, document? Yeah, in yeah, it's in there. Uh, that was very controversial when I went over to visit because the flight leader said, oh, my wingman flew into the ground. And I said, no, he did fly into the ground right after we shot him down. And uh, he didn't agree. 
And then he finally admitted that he had turned away from the action, and when he turned back, he saw him hitting the hill. So he never saw us shooting him down. But uh, we did shoot him down, I can guarantee you that. I fired 52 rounds, my wingman fired 75 rounds. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. When we got back, there's a picture, which I don't have, uh, but it, it shows Admiral Bringle, who was uh, Comcard 7, from the back, and there's about seven of us standing up there. Our skipper, the four of us, the uh, uh, one of the CAGs, and uh, they're all standing up there. And uh, when we got up there, uh, they were introducing us to Admiral Bringle, and he said, he got to my name and he looked at me, he said, if I met you before? I said, I don't think so, sir. Mm, no, I, I don't believe so. What a liar, huh? When I was a Naval Academy first class midshipman, I got in big, big trouble a couple times. And one of the times, Bringle was the commandant. And that's where I learned to tap dance in front of his desk. And his comment was, if I see you back here again, you're going to be wearing army fatigues again. So uh, I had seen him. He didn't remember the incident. I sure wasn't going to remind him. <laughs> but uh, that, that's about it, uh, unless there are any more questions. Uh, Thanks, Clint. Wait, we got a hand. Uh, no. So the uh, question was, did the Air Force yeah. turn all the Sky Raiders over to the VNAF? Here's the way it worked. Uh, most of the VNAF airplanes, almost all of them, were single-seaters. They were the single-seat version that I flew. Now, when I towed targets, I flew the multi-seat version. The multi-seat version uh, was given to the Air Force for search and rescue. In 1968, when we retired to Sky Raider, we handed all of our Sky Raiders over to the Air Force to supplement their AD-5s, which were getting worn out. They were really ready for the boneyard. To do that, we put uh, a soft tailwheel on them, landing lights, and uh, FM radios, and an extraction seat. Now, I never flew the extraction seat. Only one person in my squadron ever extracted, and that was on the third cruise, which I didn't make. And the extraction seat fired a large bullet out with a cable that gently pulled you out of the cockpit and blossomed your chute. Not for high speed, strictly for low speed. And uh, so they, the Air Force had all the extraction seats, which saved many lives. Uh, I went to a Sky Raider reunion with the Air Force many, many years ago, and uh, I was standing at uh, the bar with two guys, and they were talking. They said, yeah, that Sky Raider, that was really rough. That big old engine, you know, you, 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 just, you just couldn't keep it straight on the runway at full power. We always used normal rate to take off. And I said, huh? I said, we always used full power. I said, uh, wasn't any problem, you just had to be ahead of it. Well, Sky Raider pilots, when they went to the beach, they had one skinny leg and one fat leg. The fat leg was the one pushing the rudder to keep the airplane straight. So when I was discussing with one of the Vietnamese pilots when we were over there, uh, I asked him what happened. He said, well, I flew Sky Raiders in the war with Cambodia. You know, they declared war on Cambodia right after we left because they didn't like uh, the path at Laos, and uh, uh, so they declared war on Laos and Cambodia. Yeah. And they went in there, and they used the Sky Raiders as attack airplanes. And uh, the thing he said to me, he said, yeah, I flew the Sky Raider. He went like that with his right leg. <laughs> so, you know, everybody had to push that rudder. Uh, another question. Yeah.
Yeah. We already always told the jet drivers, you're in a targeted area for three minutes, you get shot down, we can't cover you for eight hours. Same gun shooting. Uh, what a good deal. Where did we draw this straw? Uh, but uh, to go back to your original question, uh, many of the Air Force Sky Raiders got back to the United States or were given to other countries when we left in 72, the ground part. When it was evident that uh, the North Vietnamese were going to be successful, uh, the Defense Department uh, grabbed a group of pilots and assigned them the job of flying airplanes to Thailand and Malaysia and out to the ship. There was about, I think, 80 airplanes that were saved, and some of them were Sky Raiders. So uh, the VNAF ended up, though, with uh, all of the uh, South Vietnamese Air Force Sky Raiders. They got all of those. Uh, except one guy that, one Sky Raider pilot that flew out with his family down in the, the belly. Uh, other than that, they got all of those. The Air Force ones uh, either came back to the States early or were given to other countries. But uh, there aren't many around anymore. A few. Well, thank you very much. Let's, there's another question.